This is going to be an overview of the book of Ezekiel. And the book of Ezekiel is a very interesting book of the Bible. Before I really got into it, it was one of those books that really intimidated me because it seemed so complex and had a lot of chapters. And it is a big book. It has 48 chapters, 1,273 verses, and around 39,407 words. But even though Ezekiel is writing during the Babylonian captivity, he is still way ahead of his time. The theme of Ezekiel is the second coming and the millennium. The book is not old and outdated. It's future. Ezekiel is telling you some things that hasn't happened yet. A short summary will go like this. Chapters 1 through 24 shows the destruction of Israel. Chapters 25 through 35 shows the judgment of Gentile nations. Chapters 36 through 39 shows the restoration of Israel. And chapters 40 through 48 shows you the millennial reign. And you find the Lord Jesus Christ in Ezekiel as the Son of Man. Ezekiel means he will be strengthened. But getting into the book, chapter 1, chapter 1 and verse 3 shows us that the hand of the Lord was upon him. For the lost, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. However, if you're saved, if you're a righteous man, if you're a Christian, it's your safe place. No man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Take it a step further than that. We make up his hand because we make up his body. So for the lost, it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But I want the Lord's hand on me because I'm saved. In chapter 1, Ezekiel sees the Lord on his throne coming out of the north in a whirlwind. And I did a study on that, how that whirlwind's connected with the second coming. And the Lord here is coming with the cherubim called the living creature. So let's look at the cherubim really quick. It says in verse 5, they got the likeness of a man. So I imagine them standing straight up like a man. In verse 6, they have four faces and they have four wings. In verse 7, they have straight feet like the sole of a calf's foot. In verse 7, they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. In verse 8, they have the hands of a man under their wings. They have the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle. And in verse 14, they moved like lightning. So these are incredible looking creatures. Ezekiel falls on his face because in chapter 1, he sees the glory of the Lord. Ezekiel 128 is the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So is the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So Ezekiel fears God. And in chapter 2, you see the Lord sending Ezekiel to the rebellious nation of Israel. He chose Ezekiel probably because Ezekiel fears God. Ezekiel 2, 3, it says, And he said to me, Son of man, I will send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. Ezekiel 2, 5, And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. Even if they don't receive the message, at least they know that there was a prophet among them. At least they know that there was somebody who preached. There is a lot of people today who won't receive the message, but they know somebody got up and preached it to them right, and that it was from the Lord. Even if it was just their grandma quoting a Bible verse to them. Even if it was just their pastor, who nobody even knows, that got up one Sunday and preached on hell and told them that they're going to go to hell if they don't get saved, they know that there hath been a preacher among them or a prophet among them. Ezekiel 2, 6, And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So why be afraid of them? All they could do was make fun of him and at worst kill the body. They can't take his soul. Ezekiel 2, 7 through 10 says, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. 
Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. So here's this book. And the Lord tells him to eat it. And he spreads it out before him. So before you go out and preach, spread out the book before you. And learn what the Lord says. Get a King James Bible. Open it up. Read it every day. In chapter 3, the Lord has Ezekiel eat that roll of a book. Just like we need to eat the words of God today. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So, get in the word of God. Feast on it. Ezekiel 3, 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee, then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Ezekiel 3, 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee into the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Notice he said, Speak with my words unto them, not your words. See, Ezekiel just read the words. He knows what the Lord says. Many preachers aren't saying what the Lord says because they don't know what he said. They don't have the right Bible, and they don't even read that Bible. They don't know the words. In chapter 3, the Lord makes Ezekiel a watchman. And you need to be a watchman. Find out what's popular in the world today and then preach against it. Watch out for false prophets. Watch out for wicked men. Watch out for the wicked women and warn the people. Ezekiel, third, or Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from the wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, and thou hast delivered thy soul. You're not responsible for other people's choices. You're just responsible for giving out the warning. And if you do that, you deliver yourself. In chapter 4, the Lord has Ezekiel to symbolize the siege of Jerusalem. And he says in Ezekiel 4, 12 and 13, And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of a man in their sight. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the, shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I would drive them. So you see how the Lord has Ezekiel do some crazy things in front of the people to symbolize what's going to happen to them in the future. They're going to eat the defiled bread among the Gentiles where they're driven, just like Ezekiel is told to eat dung. In chapter 5, the Lord has Ezekiel symbolize how the Lord will burn Israel by having him shave his head and beard and burn the hair and then scatter some in the wind and smite it with a knife. You see, the Jews require a sign. They need a, a crazy prophet to get up and do crazy things to get their, their attention. In chapter 6, the Lord wants Ezekiel to look toward the mountains and preach against the people's idolatry in their high places. And the high places is where they go to worship their false gods. That's why today we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The unclean spirits like those high places. Ezekiel 6.11, Thus saith the Lord God, Smite with thine hand, and stomp with thy, stamp with thy feet, and say, Alas for all the evil abominations of the house of Israel, for they shall fall by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. So there is a good proof verse for clapping and stomping while you preach. And I like that kind of preaching. But I like quiet preachers too. I like the truth no matter how it's presented. As long as they got the truth, they got the right message, they got the right book, then I like it. In chapter 7, Ezekiel explains how the Lord is going to bring his wrath down on the people for their sin. 
He proclaims how the Lord says in Ezekiel 7, 4, And mine eye shall not spare thee, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense thy ways upon thee, and thine abomination shall be in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You reap what you sow. If you're going to live wicked, then you need to expect bad things to happen in return. In Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel is picked up by the Spirit of God. Ezekiel 8, 3, And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit, me, Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner court that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Ezekiel saw what people were doing in the dark. And the problem with man is shown to be their wicked imaginations. Ezekiel 8.12 Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the uh, chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. 8.12 It says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. But the Lord sees everything people are doing behind closed doors. He sees all the sex trafficking by these big shot rich people. He sees all the crooked things going on in the government. He sees it all. In chapter 9, the Lord has idolaters killed. Ezekiel 9.9, 9. Then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. So you see, the Lord is a jealous God. And is it trying to share us with anyone or anything else? And when you are committing idolatry, you're pretty much saying you you love something more than you love God and an idol can be anything it doesn't have to be a, a statue or it, it can be yourself you can be in love with yourself so much that you're your own idol but the Lord is a jealous God and in chapter 10 you're going to read about the glory of the Lord and the cherubims again and note the sound of the cherub's wings in Ezekiel 10.5. It says, And the sound of the cherub's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. So I imagine this is a pretty loud, distinguishing sound that he's hearing. It says in verse 12, And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they forehad. So, this is a strange looking creature. Got eyes all over them, eyes in the back of their head. You, you can't get anything past them. Ezekiel 10, 14, and everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third face, and the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. So this time Ezekiel doesn't say the face of an ox. He says the face of a cherub. So possibly the face of a cherub is like the face of an ox. And then in chapter 11, the Lord wants Ezekiel to prophesy against the wicked counselors of his day and even name names. Naming names is a good thing, but sometimes men take it to an extreme when they do it every time they open their mouth or name the name of a true Bible believer just in an attempt to ruin his ministry or testimony. Naming names is very necessary sometimes, but sometimes it's completely unnecessary. In chapter 12, Ezekiel symbolizes the captivity of Judah. And in chapter 13, he gives a real hard time to the false prophets of his day. Ezekiel 13, 3, Thus said the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets! that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Just like today, woe unto the men who have seen nothing. They don't see anything because they have their eyes in the wrong place. They never crack open the book. So they've seen nothing. Ezekiel thirteen eighteen, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people? 
And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And so the women put pillows on their arms and had the men lay down in their arms to do divinations. And this is satanic, of course, but the women were also wicked. It wasn't just the men. And you know that a nation or a people is bad when even the women get satanic and wicked like they are today. You see very wicked women in entertainment. Nicki Minaj and Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion, Ellen DeGeneres. All of these wicked women with a lot of influence on your daughters. You know, a nation goes bad when the women are openly acting like whores and cussing, just like a man would. But in chapter 14, Jerusalem gets what's coming to them. And the Lord says, even if Noah and Daniel and Job prayed for them, it wouldn't spare, he wouldn't spare them. Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. In chapter 15, the Lord compares Jerusalem to a useless vine tree that's cast into the fire. It says in Ezekiel 15, 6, and 7, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. And they shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And you shall know that I am the Lord, when I set my face against them. When you think about it, nothing is more scary than fire. Look at those videos on YouTube of the people trying to escape the wildfires of California. Those are some just terrifying videos. It looks like something you'd see at the end of the world. Or those fire tornadoes that's, that you see that was captured on video. In Ezekiel 16... He goes on to talk about how wicked they have become. It says in Ezekiel 16, 24, that thou hast built also unto thee an eminent place and hast made thee a high place in every street. So they had a place on every street to worship their false gods, just like it was a convenience store or something. But look, something worse than, than Las Vegas or... Something like that, where you just have wicked stuff on every street. You know, adult bookstores, adult video stores, and wicked things on the billboards, and whores walking around on the street, and drug dealers, and crime. Ezekiel sixteen twenty five. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred, and hast opened thy feet to every one that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Verse twenty seven. Behold, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and have delivered thee into the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. So the Philistines were ashamed of them. They were so bad. And I've met Christians that acted so wicked that lost men in the break room would blush at some of the things that they said. The lost world loves to see a Christian say something or do something wicked. It gives them comfort about staying in their sin, even. That's why people, lost people look for you to cuss or to say a dirty joke or to laugh at a dirty joke or to lie or just, just do something wicked. That way, they can feel more comfortable about what they're doing when they see the Christian doing it. In chapter 18, the Lord explains how he wants the righteous man to stay righteous and the wicked man to turn from his evil ways and do righteously. Because the consequence of sin is death, and he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18.32, he says, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God, Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. So when a righteous man turned from his righteousness under the Old Testament and didn't offer the prescribed sacrifice, he would have went to hell. And since the spiritual circumcision that we have today wasn't available back then, his soul was still stuck to his flesh. And every time he sinned, it was applied to the soul. Ezekiel 18, 24, it says, But when the righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, 
and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live. All his righteousness that he hath done shall he not shall it shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Notice it calls it his righteousness. Today we have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't. The Lord imputed righteousness to Abraham before the law and gave David sure mercies under the law. But they are the sure mercies of David for a reason, because they were to David. Notice Ezekiel says, In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. This is talking about a righteous man turning from his righteousness. And if he does that and dies, he dies in his sin. And if a man dies in his sins, then he goes to hell. Jesus said, John 8, in John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. A born again Christian can't die in his sins because your sins are paid for and gone. For the Old Testament saying it was not so, they had temporary forgiveness of sins because Jesus Christ hadn't shed his blood and died yet. Of course, the Lord knew that Jesus would die on the cross. He saw through his foreknowledge that Jesus Christ would die on the cross, but he didn't apply the sacrifice before the sacrifice took place. He didn't apply the blood to the Old Testament saints before the blood had even been shed. So the Old Testament saints had to go into the heart of the earth and wait on Jesus Christ to shed his blood. And in chapter 20, the Lord talks about how he will restore Israel. Ezekiel talks about everlasting flaming fire that God will bring on the enemies of the Lord, and the people think Ezekiel is just speaking a parable. In Ezekiel 20, 47 through 49, it says, And say to the forest to the south, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, and it shall devour every green tree in thee, and every dry tree. The flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces from the south to the north shall be burned therein, and all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, they say of me, Doth he not speak parables? So, Ezekiel, when he preached about an everlasting fire, coming from the Lord, the people said, he's just kidding around. He's just speaking a, a parable. And when you preach Luke 16 today about the rich men in hell, many people say, you're just teaching a parable. It's just a parable. It wasn't a literal story. But this is a literal burning fire that will burn men. And they were even accusing Ezekiel of teaching a parable. In Ezekiel 23, the Lord uses two whores to illustrate Jerusalem and Samaria. And the Lord does this because worshiping idols is like stepping out on the Lord. There is a literal adultery that takes place when a man steps out on his wife. And there's a spiritual adultery where a man steps out on God and goes whoring after false gods, as the Bible calls it. Imagine the feeling of being cheated on. If you've ever been cheated on. Or imagine the feeling of thinking you've been cheated on. God feels even worse than that when you put idols ahead of him and step out on him. In chapter 24, Ezekiel's wife dies. And the Lord commands him not to cry about it. The Lord has him do this for a sign to Israel. Sometimes, as we've talked about, the prophets have to do some crazy things to get the attention of the people. Just like many times today, a preacher has to do crazy things to get the attention of the people. Maybe in abrasive and rough talk or rough analogies and object lessons. Just crazy things to get the people to, to look up and, and realize what's going on. People are so desensitized from sin and TV today and, and everything that they're seeing on the internet that you got to do something crazy just to get them to even look at you. In chapter 30, you see what happens when a mighty, wicked man tries to go against the Lord. In Ezekiel 30, 21 through 22, it says, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed. 
to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong to hold the sword. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong and that which was broken. And I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. So you see the fights in the movies when the enemy just gets the sword knocked out of his hand. God can bring the hand. God can break the hand of any man and grind it down to powder and knock the sword right out of the hand. Uh, no mighty man is mighty enough to fight Almighty God. In Ezekiel 33, you see how Ezekiel is Israel's watchman. It's not your responsibility to make everyone make the right decisions. It's your responsibility to get the truth out. And if you do that, you're pleasing God. And that's what required of you. He says in Ezekiel 33, 9, Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Once you warn the wicked, the blood comes off of your hands. Ezekiel 33, 11, says say unto them as i live saith the lord god i have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live turn ye turn ye from your evil ways for why will ye die o house of israel ezekiel 34 the lord will find his scattered sheep and bring them into the land and feed them upon the mountains that's what happens ezekiel 34 ezekiel also rebukes the shepherds who feed themselves, but not the flocks. Many men today will make sure that they're spiritually fed, but they never feed their own congregation. They know which Bible is the right sword, but they're too lazy to explain to the people which one is right and just leave their, their flock without a sword. They got a sword, but they're not teaching the, their flock how to use theirs. Ezekiel 34, 5 through 6 says, And they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. So the pastors today many times won't teach the Bible. They only stick to practical application at best. And when an evil beast shows up, they're fooled by him and slaughtered by him. you got to get into the doctrine of the Bible. Teach people doctrine. Teach people verse by verse through the Word of God. More than just practical application. Only through this way are they going to get really interested in the Bible. Only through this way are they going to be able to withstand false teachings and false prophets that come their way. But in chapter 35, Ezekiel speaks against Mount Seir. In chapter 36, you have a prophecy to the mountains of Israel. And then in chapter 37, you have a very popular chapter about the Valley of Dry Bones. In chapter 38, it's a prophecy against Gog. The Lord is against Gog, the chief prince of Tubal. Chief prince of Tubal. In chapter 39, the Lord restores Israel. In chapter 40, you have the vision of the new temple, the gates and the courts. Chapter 41 describes the inner temple. 42, the temple's chambers. Chapter 43, Ezekiel is brought to the gate of the east. He sees visions like he saw in the river Kibar, carried away in the spirit to the inner court. You see instructions to prepare a goat and a young bullock and a ram for a sin offering. In chapter 44, Israel is uh, brought strangers into the sanctuary. In... 45, and holy oblation of the land set apart for the Lord. And you see the portions for the prince. In 46, the, you see the prince and the feasts, boiling places for offerings. In 47, water flowing from the temple. You see the divi division of the land. In chapter 48, you got the gates of the city. And the city shall be called the Lord is there. So... That is the book of Ezekiel. It's a very interesting book. And I hope I've whet your appetite to read the book. Just slowly read each chapter. Write down something that you learn from each chapter. And you're going to find that the book isn't as complex and, and as intimidating as you think it is. It's a great book. has a lot of interesting stuff. Go through it. Mark it up. Underline. 
highlight it, whatever you got to do to stay in it.